Good evening and welcome to our public worship service here at St John's Presbyterian Church Annerley with our resident pastor Reverend Martin Duffield leading worship this evening. Again we commend to your prayers those of our church family members dealing with current health issues, some having undergone treatment, others are waiting for test results or appointments and particularly those who are seriously ill. We do uh, commend the bulletin uh, for your attention for the activities this week, our Tuesday morning Bible study this week, 10 a.m. here in the church, our evening Bible study via Zoom, 7 p.m. Thursday evening, and then next Saturday, our prayer meeting as usual, and the, also the session will meet at 9 a.m. here in the church. God willing, our worship service next Sunday will be as usual, with our own Pastor Martin leading both morning and evening worship. Annual reports were distributed today to our regular church family in preparation for the annual general meeting to be held next Sunday, 19th of March, following morning worship. Also, in view of the AGM uh, being held next Sunday, the decision has been taken not to hold the morning tea. With the Easter Remembrance season only some four weeks away, it's our intention to undertake an outreach to the households of our local area via a Easter themed leaf of drop. If you're willing and able to assist, please advise Martin. Just uh, with reference to a recent incident where one of our number had a fall in the yard, the Committee of Management reminds our church family to take particular care uh, around our church property at the moment and particularly with regards to the car park. The latest ed edition of the Challenge newspaper was made available today please ensure you have taken a copy. We are now encouraged to engage in personal preparation just prior to the call to worship. Thank you. Second Psalm and uh, verses 10 and 11. And it says, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. So be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Amen. We are going to sing um, an introit this evening from the old songs of praise, All Hail King Jesus, and we'll sing it through twice.
Let's take a moment to meet with God and to adore him in prayer this evening. Let's all pray. Well, Lord our God, our King and the Ancient of Days, we bow humbly before you this evening, the one whom we acknowledge to be the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to worship you in your majesty, in awe and wonder, in the stillness of our evening hour and in the stillness of our souls before your great presence today. We will bring our gifts of public worship to present them to you with gladness of heart and with eagerness of will. O oh Lord, this hour will come and go as you are predestined it to come and go. And we, but we will not waste it upon unworthy things when we can spend it upon you. For all that you are and all that you have done, not only just in wider human history, but in our personal pilgrimages. The number of our days you know, and how blessed are we that they have not reached their completion yet, so that we may come one more time to give you the praise and thanksgiving that belong to you and to you alone here in this place. And so hear and receive us, we pray. And everything that we have brought in praise, in attentiveness, in devotion, in love, in gratitude and in eagerness, O oh Lord, make us a double delight to yourself, not just through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, who gives us perfection in your sight, but through also the Holy Spirit of Christ, who gives us the fruit of holiness in increasing measure in our daily lives. Bless us with tokens of your peace and power tonight and send us away with glad hearts, glad because we have been here with you among us in power and grace. Jesus' name is our only plea. Amen. We're going to sing uh, from sing our first hymn tonight, O Lord, the Judge of all the earth.
So let's hear the word of God from the 12th chapter of Matthew this evening. Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 42. Verse 22. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man? and then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil, speak good things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's now meet with God to confess our sins to him, the sins of our generation and culture as well. Let's pray. Our Holy Father in heaven, we would rarely think of ourselves in the same class of people as your stubborn and faithless people in the wilderness journeys. But there are times when we are, 
we would rarely consider ourselves as foolish and as short-sighted as the generations in the days of judge, the judges when there was no king in the land but also here at times we manifest their spirit. We would not believe someone who told us that we have much in common with the returned exiles of Judea. We forgot the very reasons for the judgment of God in the decades that preceded it. But their sons and daughters still walk among us in, in truth. We, still, we sometimes wear their shoes. And this is simply because we fear too easily. We corrupt too easily. And we forget our sufferings and their lessons too quickly as those generations did in their own way. Oh Lord, we need no one to tempt us from outside in any of these cyclical and sometimes regular failings of faith, of faithfulness and of memory. Even with, with a generation or within a generation we can slide. Even within a decade we can corrupt and forget. And sometimes even yesterday is long enough for us to abandon godly ways and tomorrow is soon enough for us to sin and go on sinning as though you had never spoken, as though you had never disciplined, as though we had never learned. Truly, Lord, you choose to liken us to sheep because of all creatures they are most prone to get lost and most quickly. Unless we are led continually by your word and your spirit, unless you shepherd our lives daily, we, we slip daily deep into sin as our culture and our world do now and at such a pace, for it is without the word of God as it once was. And so we pray that you would help us to commit every day of our lives to you afresh. Help us to lean not on our own understanding, but to trust in you with all our hearts. And may we ask and often concerning your perfect will, for if you will show us, we will not only live, but we will prosper, as we could never prosper without you. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for our failures in appreciating our frailties, in appreciating your grace and your wisdom, and teach us tonight and tomorrow to, in humble obedience to walk each day afresh with your help. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name also. Amen. We shall sing now to God's praise, Your Kingdom Come on Bended Knee.
sermon tonight comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, but we'll read 3, 9 to 22. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 9. What profit has the worker from that in which he labours? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labour, it is the gift of God. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. That which is has already been, and what is to be has already been, and God requires an account of what is past. Moreover, I saw under the sun, in the place of judgment, wickedness was there, and in the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. I said in my heart, concerning the condition of the sons of men, God tests them, that they may see that they themselves are like animals. For what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them. As one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and all return to dust. Who knows the spirit of the sons of men which goes upward, and the spirit of the animal which goes down to the earth? So I perceived that nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his heritage. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? And again, to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's again meet with God in prayer and take a moment to uh, thank Him for His mercies and offerings and also to remember our missions. Our gracious God and Father, how we thank you for this day and for each day, for every day and all our days. Thank you for the usefulness in those days and for the fruitfulness and effectiveness that you give to us. Thank you also for the promise of the reward uh, and for our, our disinterest in that reward as we pursue worship and service for no other reason than we delight in you and we find our peace and our purpose in these things. Take in our gifts given this evening and through the week and may they be used mightily in aiding the work of the gospel here and everywhere to the praise of your glory. And as we think of that tonight, our Father, we think of our sister Linda Whitehouse in Sydney we do continue to pray for her needs, for her clients, in food, accommodation, clothes, and also for employment for these people who come from other lands, some of them believers, refugees from persecution, anti-Christian persecution, others who are just from other cultures and other religions, to whom Linda and her team minister. Give her opportunities to share Christian, Christian literature with her, with them, 
as she takes it with her and grant her joy through uh, the responses of your people. Help her also to maintain her health and her strength and her financial support through the mission for herself and for her fellow workers. Lord, we remember tonight to the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese. We do pray for him, for wisdom, for integrity in handling the affairs of the government and the nation. Pray also for the leader of the opposition, for Peter Dutton, and those on the opposition benches that they will be enabled to be an effective opposition, diligent, honest, faithful and courageous in confronting error or corruption as they see it constructive in their criticisms and aiding the processes of our parliament. We ask this also for the Senate. We don't often pray for the Senate and for its members, but we bring that chamber to you and remember also the minor parties, most of whom have the same moral standards and values as the Christian Church. We thank you for them and we pray that their voice would be disproportionate to their size in these matters. Bless the life and work of Peter Barnes, the Moderator General. Give him mercies in his travels and grace and courage in his public speaking and preaching. Thank you for his contribution to our church, especially during the pandemic and in the subsequent years when he has spoken so courageously against the evils being foisted on your people. Our God, as we come later to the Word of God, May it please you to teach us more good things concerning your ways, to remind us of the blessings that we possess as your servants and as your creatures and as uh, sons and daughters of the Most High God. We commend all of these things to you in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. So we shall sing, My times are in your hand, to God's praise. Lessons in God's Providence. And we begin with a truth that we are all familiar with that many people believe in God still. They have their ideas or beliefs about God, however, many of those beliefs and ideas are the result of their own imagination or scraps of information from others or religious publications fashioned into some idolatrous concept of God that is theirs. 
question of what God is really like is answered in two books. The book of divine creation and the book of divine revelation. What theologians call general and special revelation. Only the Bible, of course, tells us truly all things concerning God. Who God is. Creation and scripture tell us uh, what God is. Ecclesiastes is one of those books in the Bible which reveals what God is like and it does so in our passage tonight in these two verses from 14 and 15. Um, this little passage will reveal our God as an awesome being who rules time and history with absolute precision and certainty. He rules with irresistible force and purpose. He rules with justice and with wisdom. He does all of this without overriding or interfering with anyone's free choice. Some, that he somehow fits our freedom of will into his fixed purposes in a way that no one can fully understand. And tonight we will look at a couple of these things, God's unstoppable purposes uh, and, uh, and um, the second point which I have here, God's returning purposes. Okay, it wasn't in my introduction. So. God's unstoppable purposes and God's returning purposes. The cycles of history is what we'll be looking at. Comes out in verses 14 to 15. So God's unstoppable purposes, first of all. The preacher continues at this point in the book to look above the sun. That is, in this examination of life down on earth, from God's point of view or God's view or with God in mind, a lot of his vanity a lot of his expressions of vanity, as we've heard, is because he looks at life without God. He confesses several unchanging truths, truths that are like giant foundation stones and stability for human society and individual beings. And he says this in verse 14, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. And God does it that men should fear before him. So God does two things here. Uh, the Shorter Catechism tells us that uh, he executes his decrees and, and does two things in executing those decrees in the works of creation and providence. The question, question 8, says how does God execute his decrees or how does God carry out his decrees? And the answer is God executes his decrees in the work of creation and providence, the works of creation and providence. So God executed his decree in creation and what God does in creation we know is forever. The creation is forever. Even though Jesus spoke of heaven and earth passing away, and even if that meant the entire creation, of course it cannot. He was only speaking conditionally when he said, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter or stroke of the law shall pass. He was actually tying the permanency of the moral law's role to the, and authority to the permanency of creation itself. The creation we know has undergone judgments, but all that perished in those judgments was the world of men and beasts, not heaven and earth itself. And Psalm 33, 9 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the earth stand in awe of him, for he spoke and it was done, and he commanded, and it stood fast. After the flood he said, I will never again destroy every living creature or every living thing as I have done. And while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, Winter and summer, day and night, shall not cease. You know, of course, that at the moment there is the threat of nuclear war. The doomsday clock is apparently 90 seconds to midnight closer than it's ever been in its history. You and I know that, that the earth cannot be destroyed, much less than the universe. Now, dear brother John Tucker reminds us often, as did Richard Vaughan this morning, Jesus is coming back to this world, so there isn't any way that the earth can be blown up or in other ways destroyed. This is the same counsel that Christians gave during the Cold War, especially during the Cuban Missile Crisis. What God does, he does forever, and creation stood fast at his command, and it will stand fast at his command. It is at best renewed through flood, and at the end of time, probably by some kind of fire, as Peter talks about in 2 Peter, the term new heavens and the new earth is about renewal. 
It's not a brand new start or, a, or, or referring to a brand new planet or a brand new universe. God is our rock. And thus the planet is a rock along with the universe is designed to move through for time everlasting. The other execution of God's decree, and probably the one that this statement refers to, is of course providence. Providence is when God's predestined history falls out or comes to pass under his sovereign guidance. That too cannot be thwarted, much less undone, any more than creation. God's acts in history also stand fast. We can only observe them and learn from them in the past. We cannot alter the past. We can rewrite the past. That is to say, we can lie about the past, as evil people do, but we cannot change what really happens or happened. He revealed that there is a, uh, an irresistible, scripture reveals that there is an irresistible permanence about what God does. And it gives us a glimpse of why God is sometimes called himself the rock in many places in scripture. Psalm 28, 1 and a few chapters later in Psalm 31, 2 and 3 are examples of many where he is called the rock. Not only is the unchanging foundation upon which all creation is maintained, but what he does also we know is unchangeable. It cannot be altered once it comes to pass. That we know, but as we should all know, what is destined to come to pass will also unchangeably and without being able to be thwarted come to pass. So though we are creatures who have the complete freedom to choose and act and for which we are responsible, God's governance of all those activities of all his creatures remain complete. I mentioned the children's catechism. Um, question, question 8. Um, it's question 11, what are God's acts of providence? Without God's acts of providence are his most holy, wise and powerful preservation and control of all his creatures and all their actions. And that is the summary of what this portion of Ecclesiastes is saying. God's acts of providence, the second of the ways in which he carries out his decrees, are his most holy, wise and powerful preservation and control of all his creatures and all their actions. When God something does something, whether it's creation or providence, it stays done, as they say in the sporting world. Here is a summary of this from one of our commentators. Whatsoever God does, it shall be forever. Those words mean all God's counsels or decrees are eternal and unchangeable and his providence works effectively so as man cannot resist or hinder it. As the hymn says somewhere, God is working his purposes out. History has a set course and an end, therefore. We know this because the very end has been declared to us already in a number of places in the Old and New Testament. We know that Christ was predestined to come from before time began. We know that in spite of the efforts of fallen men and angels, nothing could stop these decrees of God being carried out. In Ephesians 1, 1 to 5, your very deliverance from sin was decreed and nothing can thwart that. This is the very profound truth that, um, that is the rock of our assurance of salvation. It is the main reason why these doctrines are revealed to us. Doctrines that some find hard to cope with. But God revealed them all for our encouragement. Therefore, as Matthew Poole says, nothing can be put to it nor anything taken from it. Men can neither do anything besides or against God's counsel or providence, nor hinder any work or act of it. This is it's a commentary on this verse. Consider this comment from a complete pagan this time, who came face to face with this reality, albeit a fairly significant pagan in King Nebuchadnezzar, who said this of God, the God of Daniel and the God of Israel, he does according to his will in the army or the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? King Nebuchadnezzar. However, we must be careful not to fall into the errors of religious fatalism here or a philosophy called mechanical determinism. The latter philosophy, mechanical determinism, asserts that everything in history is determined mechanically 
according to the simple action and reaction of the of the uh, of the components of the of the of the universe, and they cannot fall out any other way. The random chance bouncing and banging of things together include the random banging together of the new neurons in our brains, which means, according to these people, we have no real choice, no free will as a result. Things must happen because there is nothing outside of nature and the blind forces of nature to alter these things, including the banging together of the neurons of our brain. As commentator Dr. Kidner argues, the preacher knows that this is a false view of life, and that while God sustains and guides all things to their conclusion, he does it amazingly without doing violence to the will of the creature so that the creature has true free will and choice. Further, the apparent, the apparent randomness of life and circumstances not only have a wise governor of these events, but that they have consequences in the future. They have a purpose and an end with rewards for better or for worse. We are not trapped as cogs within the machinery of a of random space and time, as the mechanical determinists try to say. We have autonomy, freedom and responsibility. Here again is Dr. Kidner speaking to this. The earthbound or non-religious man, in light of our verses 14 and 15 of this whole section, is the prisoner of a system he cannot break or even bend. There is nowhere to escape and nowhere to jettison uh, what encumbers him or incriminates him. But the man of God hears these verses with no such misgivings. To him, verse 14 describes divine faithfulness, which makes the fear of God fruitful. A, a fruitful family relationship in verse 15 assures him that with God all is foreknown and nothing is overlooked. Once again, the despair of the preacher that he describes is not his despair, and it need not be ours as a result. A great illustration of God's ability to govern providence in executing the decrees determined from eternity past is, of course, fulfilled prophecy. And also in the working of prophecy, especially providence, especially in regard to sin and righteousness. Prophecy is easy to understand. God predicts something that he has decreed, like the falls of Jerusalem in 586 and 70 AD, 586 BC, 70 AD, or he predicts the birth of Christ, or the sufferings of Christ, or the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles, and we know that it has happened. No one could stop it and can stop it. Uh, all we do is carry out God's will, and all that men could do is to carry out God's will. And ultimately, that included the murder of Jesus, which became the sacrifice for our sins, in that extraordinary mixing of human responsibility and divine sovereignty in Acts chapter 2 verse 23. What is the same? Man proposes and God disposes. Well, you know, I think we could say man proposes but God predisposes. God, God, however, God's working principles for human behaviour are also unchanging. Proverbs 14.34 let me just repeat that. God's working day-to-day -day principles for human behaviour are also unchanging. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The warnings about corrupt behaviour in society through the Bible is right through the Bible from Leviticus 26.1 through to Romans 1.18 and following in those two references. And they have worked out in history and time, just as surely as prophecy worked out in history and time. Principles are as accurate in terms of their certainty as prophecy. When God warns that certain bad behaviour brings certain bad consequences, we see it. History is full of it. Not only divine prophecy, but divine principle for human behaviour brings divine troubles. And those troubles are generally Things like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, seen throughout history as they rode into different circumstances, human conflict, war, plagues, economic ruin and mass casualties. Sin is a reproach and it brings judgment. The same is true of individuals. Righteousness tends to bring benefit. Sin tends to bring trouble. These things fall out 
uh, as irreversibly as prophecy does. What God has said is true, always true, always has the same results. And this brings us nicely to the second and the final lesson from God's providence, lessons from God's providence tonight in these two verses. And that concerns this thing about God's returning purposes, the cycles of history at which he ordains. In the next verse, verse 15, God's governance comes into view again, but this time it is revealed in the necessary cycles of history which occur because of the way God has made all things and works all things. The preacher says that which has been already, that which, uh, sorry, that which is has already been, and what is to be has already been. God seeks after that which is past. The words of the first two lines speak of a history that repeats, or some say rhymes. What exists and happens now has existed and happened in the past and will exist and happen in the future. Things past, present and to come, says um, Joseph Benson, are all ordered by one constant council in all parts and ages of the world. There is a continual return of the same motions of heavenly bodies, of the same seasons of the year, of a constant succession of new generations of men and beasts, all of the same quality. Speaking of creation and the return to the cycles of creation, here is a simpler comment explaining these two lines. This time it's from Kyle and Dillitz, the German commentators. The government of God is not to be changed and does not change. His creative as well as his moral ordering of the world produce with the same laws, the same phenomena, that is, throughout time. Same laws produce the same phenomena throughout time. So how many examples are there of that which has already been and, and will be? Well, how about war? How about financial crises? How about public scandals in politics? How about the, the rise and fall of religious influence? How about things like fashions and clothing, philosophy and amusements? In fact, even non-religious philosophers and scholars, scholars have concepts of cycles of human activity which include one of the most popular current um, philosophies uh, in a book called The Fourth Turning. There are four turnings in society and we are currently, according to these two philosophers, in the fourth turning now, which is a time of turbulence and, and uh, disruption. Uh, it sees, uh, this particular book sees the cycles in history in approximately four generations. Interestingly, the second commandment of the law speaks of four generations that fall away from God, and not five, six, seven, eight, or nine, but just four. History itself gives us examples of these kinds of cycles of returning prosperity or poverty, of peace and of conflict, and of life in between. These words tell us that God has built into his creation, and especially into humans and human affairs, an order because the natures of men and angels do not change, and inevitably corruption leading to calamity will occur, and then repentance leading to restoration will follow. God governs this cycle too, and he brings from the past to the present those times to punish or reward societies, just as he will take the past into the future. History will not only repeat itself, it must do so because of this divine order with its acts and its consequences and the unchanging nature of men and angels. In fact, God wills it so to the very, in the very last line. So I read in the King James, and God requires an account of what is past. Now let me tell you what I think the verse should say more accurately. According to most commentators, God seeks again that which is past. Here's the pulpit commentary this side time explaining regarding verse 15 and that third line. The sentence is an explanation of the preceding clauses and has nothing to do with the inquisition of the day of judgment. It is saying that the future will be a reproduction of the past. The laws which regulate things change not. The moral government is exercised by him who is and was and is to come and therefore in effect history repeats itself the same causes producing the same phenomena. That's why 
we see what we see consistently. Is that not so? Look at history. Some people argue that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. So what's the difference? It's telling you that humans don't change as to their fundamental nature, that they inevitably make the same mistakes. And so often, so often they make those mistakes that we can say with many people have said this, the only thing that men learn from history is that men never learn from history. There was a the famous somewhat despairing song in the 1960s by a, by a man named Pete Seeger. It was called, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? Some of you will remember it. The last line of the chorus says, When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? Historians tell us, with regard to the big issues of politics and social theory, that we never do learn. Solomon's comment, that there is nothing new under the sun is another way of putting this. 20th century English preacher Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said of, the, of growing old that there is great value in getting to 80 with regard to the errors of the church because if you live long enough you will see the same error crop up in the third generation that you saw in the first of your generations or the second. The cycles of history including the errors and heresies in the church. Why does God seek that which is past to bring it up again? Is it not precisely because we have made the same mistakes? Um, or even committed the same evil again? Look at the story of the judges. How many times did the scenario play out that God sent famine or marauding vandals or invading armies because they fell back into idolatry? Why did he seek past phenomena? Past phenomena. It was because Israel kept going back into the foolishness in the present, in disobedience, that brought the punishments that they experienced in the past. The punishment is the same because the sin is the same. Consequences are revised because uh, uh, consequences are revised because uh, we we revise the follies that bring them. When will we ever learn indeed, might we ask? If we remembered history, we would learn. So what other reasons are there for us to learn before we close tonight? The preacher warns us about the future from the past. Winston Churchill is one of a number of people, again, who said, the further you look into the past, the further you can see into the future. The men of Issachar, of whom it was said that they understood the times and knew what Israel should do, understood the times because they understood the past. They also understood the present. And they understood the past and the present both in the light of God's word and law. This remains true for us. If we understand God's attitude to human behaviour, if you look at his dealings with nations in the past, even recent centuries, if you grasp the law of God, if you are sensitive to evil through it, it is not hard to see the past in the future and in the present. In other words, if you know how God has reacted in the past to certain types of behaviours, national or personal or communal, behaviours like religious apostasy or sexual immorality or ethical declension, then you can predict with accuracy trouble is coming. Maybe not the time, but you can predict it with certainty. As it came in the past, under similar circumstances, as God sought it and brought it into the present. So there is an exhortation here for us. We need to learn to think biblically. We need to learn to see and to think like God. These things are possible if his word is searched and understood by each a generation of fresh. There is another lesson from God's providential workings in history, and that is here mentioned, and it's stated in verse 14. God does it that men should fear before him. Now what can we say of this implication? It is this, when we realise that God sovereignly orders events of history, through his providential governance of all of his creatures and all their actions, as the children's catechism says, then fear should be the result. In the Hebrew, the form of the verb here suggests a very simple fear, meaning to be frightened of someone or something. 
God does it that men should be frightened of him. Some other forms of the verb refer or use the word awe, which is a little less than fear, but speaks more of great reverence or respect for God. Whatever emotional response we talk about in terms of the word fear, realising that God is the master of time and history and the judge of it, as we shall see in the weeks to come, should produce fear, and both types of fear. We should be frightened of God for sinning. We should stand in awe of God for his greatness. However, an emotional response is not the end of this fear. The law itself says that this fear should be accompanied, not surprisingly, by obedience. Deuteronomy 8.6 says, Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Same word. This is part of the conclusion of the book of Ecclesiastes in 12.13. Now while it is true that the love of God is the primary reason now to obey God, probably was in the beginning, in the law, certainly was, uh, and walk in his ways, fear is mentioned as well. And there is a good reason for that in terms of consequences. You have heard me often enough refer to the covenantal blessings and curses of Leviticus 26.1 and Deuteronomy 28.1. Remember the preface to the commandments. It's speaking about the love of God, the grace of God for Israel in bringing her out of bondage. But where that fails to produce obedience in the return of love, and obedience of love, then the fear of a holy God, who will by no means clear the guilty, remains as another incentive to obey for our good. The New Testament has similar warnings. For example, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 19 to 31, and especially if you read from verse 26, we serve a sovereign God who orders all things according to his holy purposes, who uses and works the cycles of history to reward and chastise his people. He is imminent in people's lives as he is in nations' lives and communities' lives. If God seeks the things of the past in dealing with the present, which rhymes or repeats the past, then learn and fear is what this portion of Scripture will tell us. So the lessons of providence from these two verses are clear in regard to these things. God's unstoppable purposes and his returning purposes teach us to learn and fear. We are to study his character, meditate upon his dealings. We should also fear him as Christians, as Peter said in 1 Peter 1.17, because he judges each man's work impartially, and also because, somewhere else he says, judgment begins with a household of faith. Paul said that he is no respecter of persons, or before, before, before whom one day we shall all stand and give an account, as this book and both testaments will tell us. In the end, Calvary itself is a warning about God's determination not merely to judge the works of people, but to either forgive or to punish offensive works. Sin's fate is on full display on the cross. Sin will be dealt with by the means of grace or justice. It is our choice. May it please God to set each one of us on the path to peace and salvation through the mercy afforded by the cross of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord our God, we thank you again for reminding us of your greatness, your wisdom and your power. And we thank you for um, eyes to see and ears to hear that we are not left in despair as some people are as they contemplate the circumstances of history, whether it's international, national or personal. Thank you for the reminder that you are the rock of, uh, of the created universe as much as you are the rock of our salvation. We do pray that you take us away from this place as always encouraged and assured by the fact of who you are and of your sovereign concern for us. We ask these things and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now uh, the last hymn, Great God, What Do I See and Hear?
we shall have the benediction from 2 Corinthians and 13 and 14. 2 Corinthians 13 14. And then we shall sing the three five amen to conclude. Now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.